You know, one of the most concerning aspects of the last 19 months has been an outrageous amount of misinformation and half-truths. It's been brought to you by a lot of so-called experts. As the people who are on the front lines of this pandemic or who dedicated to saving lives, it's been disheartening and frustrating and even sometimes downright devastating. I'm Gerald Harmon, president of the AMA. You know, I have a radical idea. When it comes to medicine, healthcare advice, I think doctors should be the loudest, most vocal in the room. Not politicians, not TV hosts, not celebrities, and not the folks peddling conspiracy theories. How about we put our trust in doctors to pull us out of this crisis instead of the politicians and the media personalities we so often see on TV? How about we listen to physicians when it comes to issues of public health? Does that seem radical to you? That was Dr. Gerald Harmon, AMA president. And I'm Todd Unger, AMA's chief experience officer. And in this episode of Moving Medicine, I'll be speaking with Dr. Peter Hotez on how physicians can be a voice of truth for patients and how to navigate social media given the presence of disinformation and misinformation on these channels. Dr. Hotez is a renowned scientist physician, and advocate. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter Hotez, for joining us on this important segment. Dr. Hotez, we've been really fortunate to have had the chance to talk with you a number of times during the course of the pandemic, and uh, it's been inspiring to me. Uh, the pandemic has revealed a lot about uh, the need for expertise and the resilience of our nation's physicians, but it's also revealed uh, more than ever, how important it is to elevate physician voices. Um, I know it sounds like a kind of a wild idea, but when it comes to medicine and people's health, we believe that physicians should be the loudest voice in the room. And we are really making an effort to make that happen. So uh, while you've been in, uh, vocal on important issues throughout your entire career in medicine during the pandemic, you've been a strong, trusted voice of science, uh, capable of cutting through the noise and being heard, we want to learn more about how you do that and what your secrets are. So uh, we're going to ask you to share uh, that expertise with us today. So I'm just going to start with a little bit of a background question. Obviously, not something they teach you in medical school. At some point uh, in your career, this is something that's become very important to you. Can you talk us, you know, take us back in time? When, when did you decide to start speaking out, becoming more visible? Well, first of all, before I do that, I just want to put in a good word for you, Todd, because you and the AMA have been out in front on on giving physician voices during this pandemic. You know, when I when I identify, you know, who were the stand up organizations during this pandemic that really tried to put the the voice of the medical community out there in sort of a no nonsense, straightforward way. You know, you and the American Medical Association you know, are pretty high on that and get high marks for that. So just thank you for, for all of your effort and advocacy. It's been very meaningful for me to be talking with you these last two years. Um, with regard to your question, it's kind of an interesting, I'll, I'll, I'll say it this way. So uh, I ran into uh, my, my old roommate from college, um, who's, uh, who himself is a very important professor at Harvard Medical School, Matt Waldor. And he said to me, Pete, back then, oh, they called me Pete in college, you know, you know, we always knew you were one of these guys going to be an MD, PhD scientist studying parasitic and tropical diseases. I even knew that in college. He said the part that no one, no one figured on was all the public engagement that you were doing in the, and, uh, you know, you know, being out there in the, in the public domain. And, and, and I think he's right, I, you know, because the the whole idea was for me to be a laboratory investigator i knew i wanted to study parasitic diseases and tropical diseases and develop vaccines the public engagement piece came later in life it really started when i was uh back when i was a department chair of microbiology in washington dc at george washington university when the diseases i was studying were named by the millennium development goals as the other diseases I said, wait a minute, you know, I'm devoting my life to something called other diseases. No, I'm not going to do that. So I, we got together with two colleagues from, uh, I got together with two colleagues from the UK, uh, David Molyneux at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, Alan Fennick at Imperial College London. And we started rebranding them as neglected tropical diseases and, you know, being our own advocates, scientists as advocates. And um, it was very effective. And 
now more than a billion people get treated every year for neglected tropical diseases in part because of that you know coming up with some good ideas for solutions and and the branding and and i found it meaningful and and this has always been the struggle my whole life is i love the science i love the lab meetings i love writing the papers but i also like the other piece too the the public engagement and and it's not easy to do both you wind up doing two full-time jobs as a consequence, but it in, in its own way, it reinforces each other. And then around the vaccines, when we first started getting acquainted, even pre-pandemic, uh, you know, I'd written this book, Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, about my daughter and standing up to this very aggressive anti-vaccine lobby that had gotten so strong here in Texas. Again, it was to fill a need. You know, there was a gap, there was a void, and there was a place for a physician scientist to say, hey, wait a minute, this is not this is not reality. Here's the reality, and to be able to, you know, use my voice to explain the science, and and this is of course has happened, and this prepared me well for COVID nineteen because we had been working on coronavirus vaccines for ten years in addition to our parasitic disease vaccines, and and each time whether it was neglected tropical diseases or vaccines and autism, uh, and then now COVID nineteen vaccines, I found myself uniquely positioned. And would say to myself, well, if I don't do this, who will? And and felt that it was an important public service. And because I enjoy explaining the science, it it's just seemed to work work with me. You know, I, I read your latest book, which is uh, a lot about preventing the next pandemic. And you lay out, you know, this kind of, for lack of better words, an ecosystem that can lead to a uh, really bad result in terms of kind of the, the, the next pandemic wave. One of the key things that you focus in there is on, you know, mis- misinformation, anti-vaccine skepticism. It seems like, you know, these days, you know, whether it's hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, even, you know, betadine, uh, people are really following a lot of non-experts and believing misinformation out there. I just, I have to ask you, what what are we doing wrong Yeah, no, I mean, this misinformation or disinformation, disinformation referring to deliberate intent has really gone off the rails, of course, in COVID-19 like we've never seen. And and I've been actually predicting it for a while, just seeing the trends that are happening. And it took a pandemic to bring it to full fruition, unfortunately. And the, the tragedy is this, Todd. I mean, if you think about what's happened over this past summer into the fall, We've lost 100,000 Americans to COVID-19, despite the availability of safe and effective vaccines. So these are individuals whose lives, you know, were needlessly lost. They could have been saved had they gotten vaccinated, but they didn't either because they believed the disinformation or in too many cases, they were defiant that, that belonging to the tribe or the club meant not getting vaccinated and taking alternative, quote, cures that don't work, like hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin or crazy vitamin supplements. And and I don't even call it misinformation or disinformation anymore. I call it anti-science aggression because that's what it is. This this is not random stuff. There are groups that are actively, you know, perpetrating this and actually, you know, feeding our internet with uh, ag- aggressive anti-science disinformation. And I know there's a lot of attention right now in the social media companies and our Surgeon General, who is a terrific guy, Vivek Murthy, has been going hot and heavy on Facebook and some of the other social media platforms. But, you know, what I've told Vivek and and others is, yeah, they're the, they're the, you know, a mechanism for the information, but it still doesn't get to the source of the disinformation. And and that's the hardest to talk about because as a physician or physician scientist, it takes us way out of our comfort zone to talk about where the sources are. Because as physicians, physician scientists, my training was always, hey, you don't talk about politics, you know, you're supposed to be above all that. But, you know, what I found is I don't know how to talk about it without talking about it. So I talk about it. And and a lot of it is coming from political extremism on the right. And we saw this at the at the CPAC conference where, you know, members of Congress were getting up there and saying vaccines are uh, instruments of social control and 
or literally they would say, well, first they're going to vaccinate you, then they're going to take away your guns and your Bibles. And as ridiculous as that sounds to us, there are large segments of the population that believed it. And then it was amplified on some of the conservative news outlets. And they would go after me, you know, I'd be sitting there and somebody would call me, hey, did you hear what they, did you hear what Laura Ingram and Governor DeSanctis said about you on Fox News? And I'm like, why is Governor, Governor of Florida talking about me? I'm not even connected to Florida in any way. And, and that's the hard thing to talk about, right? Because all of our training says you don't. But, you know, at some point to save lives, you have to be able to have a frank discussion. And, and the way I say it, Todd, and I've said this before to you, is I'm not politicizing anything. It's those guys are politicizing it. And it's up to us to say, you know what, anti-science does not belong in this uh, this agenda and this is this is not your fight take it out of whatever political things you're doing stop it because now it's causing loss of life on a scale i couldn't ever imagine before you know when we talk about the things we build infrastructure to fight things like nuclear proliferation or global terrorism or or um, cyber attacks you know we invest millions maybe billions every year as a country on infrastructure to stop that sort of thing. But anti-science, anti-science aggression, it's killing more Americans than all of those other things combined. And yet, you know, we, somehow we feel we're not supposed to talk about it, much less put up infrastructure to combat it. And I think we have to face that. And, and, and we do it because we're caring physicians and physician scientists. And, and it's our obligation to start you know, putting up ways to, to confront it in, in a non-judgmental way, just saying, look, we can't, as a society, we can't tolerate this. Medicine doesn't stand still, and neither do we. AMA members don't just keep up with medicine, they shape its future. Help move medicine, join the movement. Visit ama-assn.org slash moving medicine. I heard you say in that response, a bunch of answers to the following questions, but you know we're here to to encourage physicians to become more visible, become those advocates, because um, we are in a situation where the reality is that there is that anti-science aggression out there that's that's killing people. I mean, what do you what else you know do you see that prevents physicians from becoming more visible? How do we get? You know, more physicians on the air, whether it's you know through traditional broadcast media or social media, you name it. Well, you know, part of the problem, Todd, is the the ecosystem doesn't encourage physicians to do this, especially at academic health centers, right? I mean, I can promise you that your department chair, your attending, your uh, your dean is not gonna not gonna berate you for not being out there on social media more, or or doing or writing op-eds and things like that. And that's because we haven't cut the, this, at least the academic health centers especially have not caught up. I mean, academic health centers tend to be fairly risk averse and they are more often than not don't like their docs and physician scientists speaking out on social justice issues and everything else. They, you know, they're out there to protect the institution. And, and so the message is you kind of do it at your own peril and rather than something that that's actively encouraged and we have to figure out a way to make that culture shift to basically say you know um speaking out on issues and and finding productive ways to engage the public whether it's through you know writing perspective pieces for medical journals or writing op-ed pieces for your local newspaper and and some social media there's some unproductive ways to do social media too is, is encouraged and and recognized and and you know even I'm evaluated every year right as a professor and dean and you know what is what's on my annual evaluation form well I'm not seeing patients anymore but you know I'm evaluated on my grants and my papers right that's that's what they want to see and and even the single author books I write are there's no place on the form for it so so we've got to figure out a way to say that this is important to save you know it's not it's not it's not for everybody. Not everybody wants to do it or would be particularly good at it. But for those who, especially among some of the young physicians who really want to be out there, um, then there should be these outlets. So we have to we have to change how how we do our medical training to provide ways to how we how you 
how you can engage the public in meaningful ways, uh, sort of do's and don'ts, so get a sense of what's not going to be productive, how to cultivate your brand to be out there and 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 make meaningful statements uh, how, and do this in your a residency education and even for junior attending physicians. And slowly we can kind of turn that page and 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 make it more commonplace. Uh, but it's but it's still the message still is very much, you know, do this at your own peril. You know, at best we'll tolerate it, provided you don't get too out of line and say anything that will embarrass the institution. And you know, and that's what that's what if that's what's in front of you, then you'd think two or three times before being out there. Yeah, I think what you said is so important. It it is almost like the rules changed. We have well coordinated efforts in that uh, anti science aggression group, uh, and you know we have to change our rules basically to address yeah, I mean, that these, as well. The, these are not mom and pop or grassroots organizations anymore. These are well organized, well funded organizations. You know the. The Center for Countering Digital Hate. It's amazing we have to have an organization called the Center for Countering Digital Hate, based in Washington D.C. You know, identifies about a dozen organizations, non-governmental organizations, called the Disinformation Dozen that are monetizing the internet. Well organized, well funded. Then you have the political aggression from political extremism on the right, and we've seen that play out and responsible for so many lives lost. And then even state actors like the Russian government under under Putin and, and doing this and using this as, as a wedge issue to divide our country and and targeting scientists and, and physicians, which is part part of the authoritarian aggression as well. And so we have to be able to report on the ecos on that on that aggression, what it is in order to begin counteracting it. And and you're right, I think it's accelerated. I mean, there, there were pieces there that I've been writing about, we've been talking about over the years, but it's accelerated like never before during these very unstable times. Well, in addition to kind of making the decision to become more visible, you know, a big part of this is around how to communicate the message. Um, how How do you blend science and storytelling in a way that, uh, you know, the facts still are the hero, but it's persuasive. Yeah, well, one of the things that I do that I found very effective is I'm not afraid to go into some complexity and to go into some detail, you know, without the use of jargon, because that, that confuses people, but spending a little bit of time explaining the assumptions, that's really worked well for me. And I think too much, you know, there's the old style of communicating was they would tell you, well, you have to, to talk about medical science or medicine, you have to talk to the American people like they're in the fourth grade or the sixth grade. And, and I found the opposite to be true. I think that's an old fashioned idea. We, you know, when everybody still had dial up modem computers and compact computers and Ask Jeeves was the major search engine, right? I mean, this is the world has changed and people are a lot more sophisticated now. And, and I think the old style of communication still says you have to communicate to the American people like they're in the fourth or sixth grade. And I, and I think some of our health and human services agencies still that make that mistake. What I do is, you know, people know when they see me, I'm going to talk about some of the science and some of the straightforward and people seem to like it. And, and I think people are willing to tolerate more complexity than they have in their past if in the past, if their lives depend on it or if the lives of their loved ones depend on it. The other thing I do is um, I'm, I don't mind showing flashes of emotion, you know, whether it's, you know, I've cried a couple of times on um, CNN and MSNBC because it's just so freaking sad, you know, the information I'm conveying. And that builds trust if people, if people, you know, what people want to see as much as accurate information is authenticity, you know, and, and by doing that, it, it provides reassurance that you're a real person. It's actually not too different from when I used to see patients when I was a pediatric infectious disease attending, you know, I would, I would sit, sit in the, in the hospital room and talk to the parents and, and talk like a real person. And, and that was very and they'd even given my own home cell phone, my home from home number or my cell number. And, and that built a lot of trust. Um, and so I think the, that's, so try to, 
you know, don't be afraid to show who you are. Um, and, and people respond to that. And so I think th those things are important as well, you know, being able to uh, have people show you that you're not just some nameless or faceless person, that you're a real person, that you care about this stuff and you're able to convey, convey passion. And, and uh, look, let's face it, I'm not on the cable news networks for my good looks, right? I mean, I'm, you know, there's, they're, they're clearly, they keep having me back because I'm conveying it's the information in a very authentic, well, the bow tie, that, that <laughs> does help. And it, and it adds some IQ points too. So, uh, so that, that's always good. So, yeah, no, the other message is start wearing a bow tie and, you know, I mean, just, just, just think, just think, Todd, where you'd be right now if you'd, you'd be a, that, 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 that would definitely be a presidential candidate by now. You know? Well, I, I say I, uh, I thought about you last week because uh, I received uh, a kind of a nasty me uh, message on Instagram, which just completely mystified me from someone that I don't follow or I'm not connected to. And I checked out uh, their profile and it was a person who in their profile said they were fax free or something like that. So it, it, uh, the light went on. I was like, Clearly, someone had seen, you know, the COVID nineteen updates uh, that we've been doing, and was kind of yeah, yeah. Watch out, watch, watch out for the guys who have you know, have the word freedom in their profile, because mm -hmm. uh, you know it's this phony health freedom movement, right? There's nothing about freedom; it's about authoritarian control, and mm -hmm. and uh, so you know you you see these buzz words, you know, buzzwords, freedom, a lot of choice stuff, um, tyranny. You know that they're fighting tyranny. They're not. They're they're actually victims. They're victims of the anti-science aggression, and mm -hmm. and they've bought into this in in ways that are actually more than self-defeating. In some cases, outright dangerous. It could lead to loss of life. I uh, I'm I'm curious from you, you. You you've mentioned before. You know there is some personal risk at doing this. When, when you advise uh, physicians on, you know, do's and don'ts of becoming more visible, is there any additional information, not just beyond personal risk, but ways to, to make this happen? Well, I think, you know, there's, I think one of the messages also is there's so many, there's so much suffering in this world, right? Um, there's so many issues you can take on, do ones that are meaningful to you and do ones that are kind of consistent with your career, right? I mean, the reason I got into combat, combating anti-vaccine uh, uh, sentiments, because I was a vaccine scientist and a daughter with autism, right? Um, but there are other things out there as well. So if you're going to take on socially important issues, try to do it in a way that's consistent with your career path. And, and by that, you know, that means knowing where you're going. Try to create a roadmap for yourself, build your own brand and, and do what's meaningful. And that means trying to really think about what does your future look like as a physician? Um, you know, is it, and in terms of what does success look like 10 years from now? What, what problem do you want to solve in life? And then the, then the social engagement comes naturally rather than making it a one-off thing that has nothing to do with your career interests. Try to you know, be, create a consistent story, consist, I use the word brand sometimes, I even wrote an article in public library science about cultivating your physician or scientific brand and, and, and do that and with, so that it's joyful and meaningful to you. And so that the passion is, is real. Don't just pick a, an issue because you think it's the topic du jour and, and you think you have to take a stand on it. Um, uh, you know, try to be strategic in in the social issues that you take on, and and thoughtful, and and try to find things where you can make a difference, where your where your knowledge as a subject matter expert can really make make an impact. Medicine doesn't stand still, and neither do we. AMA members don't just keep up with medicine; they shape its future. Help move medicine. Join the movement. Visit ama-assn.org slash moving medicine. You know, we talked about um, this not necessarily being in the comfort zone of a lot of physicians, um, but uh, a lot of young physicians out there uh, are more adept on social media. You know, in terms of training those next generations to deal with the reality that we've got in front of us right now is, you know, 
Is this something we should be teaching in medical school? Who's going who's gonna to do this training? Yeah, well, it, it should be taught, but not just the social media. So, you know, I'm on social media, um, mostly Twitter, and I, and I do it in order to mostly to anything that I've written or I've spoken about to get it kind of out there. What, what I don't do on Twitter is get into Twitter wars or Twitter fights with people. I think that's a rabbit hole. That's just a, a big time sink and, and designed to make you look awful and make you feel bad about yourself as well. Um, so, uh, so I use social media, mostly Twitter, as part of a tool in a toolbox. It's just part of one thing that I do in terms of social engagement, along with my books and and my um, and my you know perspective pieces and op-ed pieces, which actually I find more meaningful than social media. Social so social media is just one sm a small component of of what I do, and and I think then you'll find it more meaningful as well. It shouldn't only be about social media because it's not that rewarding at the end. I mean, it's, I think it's important to do it, get your name out there, get your brand out there, uh, but it's, it's, it's not always fun. It's usually not very fun. So, and, and it's hard to you know, build your, I use brand, build your uh, um, identity just around social media. And part of the problem is they don't teach that in medical school or residency. And, but I think, you know, you could do it in a, in a way of, you know, how to build your brand, how to, how to build a portfolio of public engagement. I think, you know, young people would love it, but it's, again, it's just not part of the ecosystem, right? The, the academic health center is, is, is not set up to do that. Um, it, it, it basically sends the message well, if you have to do it, do it, but you know, do it at your own peril. We're not too thrilled about it. What can the AMA do uh, to support this elevation of physician voices? Well, I think you're already doing that, right? I mean, the fact that we're having this discussion is sending a very important signal that, hey, this stuff's important. You know, this is what hap if we don't have our if we don't have a voice you know, look, look what happens in terms of lives lost because of misinformation, disinformation, or anti-science aggression. And, and so this is a response. So just by the fact that we're having this discussion now, um, is in itself is, is landmark. This would not have, I can tell you, this would not have happened, you know, even five years ago, probably. Um, so I think that's one. I think second, um, you know, putting out training courses on, on how to do this. I mean, how, you know, I had to learn mostly through trial and error, more, more error than trial. Um, and, and, but there is, there are methods for, for doing this and bringing on board, you know, people who understand communication and in, in a modern sense, not the old way, but, but, but the new way of doing that. And what are, and also providing platforms and what are the opportunities, you know, it's and and the point is it goes way beyond social media and and how to work with your university office of communications or your academic health center office of communications or hospital office of communications and and how to enlist them engage them in this uh, because there is there's a way to do that too and and not to be someone who just goes off and is rogue all the time and a headache to the office of communications i think is is really important um, and maybe even provide some training modules as well. I think that could be interesting. And, and also, you know, providing examples of, of how it's made a difference, how, it, it, how it's beneficial to the medical community to do that. And I think, you know, right now, um, AMA is one of the few um, professional organizations um, for physicians that's really stepping up to do this. And and I think it's having a big impact on it. I think this, this is gonna be an important new activity for the organization. And I think, and people will love you for it because it's saving lives. We're just getting started. Last question for you. Uh, what, would, what advice, uh, final words, would you wanna share? Um, in terms of help, you know, I, you know, getting the support on social media is great because the aggression is pretty brutal. So, you know, getting that tweet every now and then that says, hey, you know, we've got your back and, you know, we see what these guys are doing. I think that's that in itself is is uh, really helpful. And I would just say, you know, just 
you know, trying to focus on your patients and getting accurate information out there and, and recognizing from this that your patients are the victims here. They're the victims of the anti-science aggression and, and as a consequence, they're doing things which are injuring their health and getting educated uh, about why this is happening and, and, and slowly trying to diffuse um, um, how, how aggressive this is. Number one thing for everybody out there, just get on Twitter and follow Dr. Hotez and uh, share the important uh, statements that he makes on Twitter and similar Surgeon General, uh, Tom Frieden, uh, Paul Offit. Uh, these are a lot of the you know very outspoken positions we get a chance to talk to you out here. Just, we just also... don't spend just don't spend too much time on Twitter. It's just a... <laughs> And, and there are lives and, to be and saved. Go, and, <laughs> and go write a perspective or commentary piece in a journal of your of your area of interest and and get get credit for getting a publication to advance your career or or maybe a piece in your local paper and and uh, that's equally even more important. Well, Dr. Hotez, thank you so much for being here. That wraps up our discussion uh, for today. We're going to use uh, the information, the perspective that you shared with us to wrap up our efforts to elevate physician voices. And thanks again for all the work that you do for our country and the patients across this, this nation uh, and for just being a strong voice in a really challenging time in healthcare. We bring you back now to AMA President, Dr. Harmon. What's important is how we, the doctors, can cut through this nonsense and take back the ear of America. How we can make sure ours is the truest, loudest, most stable voice in the room when it comes to health care, health policy, and what's necessary and prudent to keep the public safe. That's not radical. That's just good sense. You can subscribe to Moving Medicine and other great AMA podcasts anywhere you listen to yours or visit ama-assn.org slash podcasts. I'm Todd Unger, and this is Moving Medicine.